Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Good morning. What a pleasure it is to be here, and I'm so thankful to, uh, to have the opportunity to speak to you on God's Word this morning. Maybe now you can hear me. Okay. All right. I'll try to not be yelling at this thing. So. so, I have a question. How many of us like to take tests? Yeah. I tell, yeah. Yeah, let me tell you a story of me as a child. I, I lived right across the street from the elementary school, and I can remember dreading spelling tests. So much so that when it, I knew I had a spelling test after lunch, and this is before Amber Alerts, and, and when, you know, this is the early 80s. And so whenever I knew I had to take a spelling test after lunch, I ran home. Apparently that they, they they missed me for some reason when and uh, they sent the principal over to my house to find me and my mom she couldn't find me in the house she found me hiding in the backyard and needless to say uh, I had my rear end rearranged that day for embarrassing my mother and had to take the test anyway so so you can understand I, I'm not big on tests but how about a test for God. We can see in 1 John, and that's where we'll be spending the majority of our time today, in 1 John, um, there was a necessity for things to be tested. There was a necessity because of false teachings. We know that false teaching had creeped into the early church. We know from 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 3, that they were coming. But there will were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemy. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. So Peter's saying they're coming. We know that they came. We know from Jude, verses 3 and 4, that they were there. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning common salvation, he wanted to write to them about the common salvation. He didn't want to write to them about what he was about to have to say. But he says, I found it necessary to write to you extorting, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once and all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who were long ago marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter says they're coming. Jude says they're here. John says they've come in among us. They've gone, but they're coming back. So 1 John 2, verses 18 and 19, he says, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know this is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that they that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. So Peter says they were coming. Jude says they're here. John says they came. They went out, but they're coming back. So he gives certain tests through this. But what false teaching is John speaking of here? From Well, we can see from church history and from study, we can know that it was Gnosticism. Gnosticism was ravaging the church in the time that John wrote. This is apparently in the last 10 years of the first century that John's writing this. Gnosticism derives from, the, from a Greek word, gnosis, which means knowledge. These people claim to have a superior knowledge of Jesus Christ and of the Word. They claim to have a superior knowledge of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and the man. But what they had was false teaching. The superior knowledge led them to, to live a life of indulgences because there were two brands in Gnosticism. The first was Docetic Gnostics, and they denied the actual humanity of Christ. They regarded all flesh as inherently sinful. And this, 
it was impossible for Christ to be sinless and actually be a man. We know this is, this is a false teaching. And then there's Serinthian Gnostics who attempted to distinguish between Christ and Jesus. They claimed that Jesus was the offspring of Joseph and Mary and that Christ descended upon Jesus at his baptism and left him. So they're trying to say that he wasn't the Son of God. That the Spirit of God descended upon him at baptism and then left, and left him as a man. So we know this to be false teaching. Gnosticism, either kind, is evil for two reasons. It denies the incarnation of Christ, and we know this is the basic truth of Christianity. We know this from John 3.16. For, so for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This was God's son. It wasn't the seed of Joseph. John 1, verses 1 and 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And the Word was with God. And the same in the beginning with God. All things are made by Him, and without Him, nothing was made. So we know that Jesus was from the beginning of time. He was with God from the beginning of time. The Gnosticism is a false teaching. John 1 and 14, As the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So He was made flesh. Saying that Jesus didn't come in the flesh because flesh is inherently evil is false teaching. We know that. Luke 24, verse 39. Behold my hands, my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you have seen me. So if he just came in and occupied Jesus after the baptism and then left, that's false. Jesus refutes that himself. John is refuting this. Gnosticism assumes that flesh is inherently evil, which co contradicts the basic Bible teaching that, that truth, the truth that everyone enters the world free of guilt and sin. How do we know this? Well, the Bible teaches this in Ezekiel 18, verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteous of the righteous, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wicked of the, the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So we know we're not born sinners. Now we know that we have sin, but that isn't we're not born into it. The flesh isn't inherently born with sinful characteristics. So John immediately, as we can see, we're gonna read verses 1 through 4, and see that John starts his letter combating this. He starts this letter combating Gnosticism. Read with me verse, verse 1, and John, the first epistle of John, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which we have looked upon and handled with our hands concerning the word of life, he talks about three of the five senses right here that we have that we have heard, seen with our eyes, looked upon, and handled with our hands. This wasn't there was no false truth in this, and this is something they knew from the beginning that the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declared to you that the eternal life which was with the Father and which was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard and declare to you, that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And here's the whole point of the whole letter. That these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Because you can't have, your joy isn't going to be full if you're, you're following false teaching. If you don't have an idea of what Christ was. Who he is to us today. You're not going to have joy if you follow false teaching. We see that around us today. 
We see a lot of false teachings going on. We must make sure we measure that. That we go by these tests of the word. We're going to be looking at five different tests found in 1 John. The first is the test of fellowship. Then we'll be looking at the test of obedience. Then the test of love. And then the test of the truth. And finally, we'll be looking at the test of the spirit. So let's go together to chapter 1 in verses 5 through 7 where we'll find the test of fellowship. Let's read this together. This is the message which you've heard from him and declared to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So we know that God is light. We know it from the Bible. We know that he is the author of light, James 1.17. We know that he is the creator of light, Genesis 1.3. We know that he is bathed in the perpetual light, 1 Timothy 6, 16. And that the, the light in which Christians are walk is his, 1 Peter 2, 9. We know that this light that is God represents truth, purity, and goodness. But in contrast to that, darkness represents ignorance, superstition, and sin. We know that the darkness... And the followers of this darkness are of the devil. We know this from that they are the rulers of this world, Ephesians 6, 12. And that they have domain and power of darkness, Colossians 1, 13. So, let's keep reading here. Now that we understand God is light and in him is no darkness. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So we can't walk in darkness and say we have fellowship with God. That's what these Gnostics were trying to do. They were trying to say, oh, we have fellowship with you, but here's these false teachings. We must make sure that we test all things to make sure that the fellowship that we have with each other is in truth. And when there is error, we call it out as error. We don't hide it or say, well, maybe, okay, that's your opinion. No, we say that is sinful error. Just as he was calling these Gnostics out on their sinful error, that if they walked in this darkness, if they walked in this sin, that they weren't walking with God, that they weren't in fellowship with those in the light, with those who believe in Christ Jesus as the Son of God, as the Son of Man. So, continue on. But if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanses us from all sin. So what does it mean to walk in the light? Well, as Christians, that means we follow. We're obedient. We walk in the light that is the truth. We walk in the light that God, that we don't hide things. We don't hide sinful behavior. We admit to it. We declare our sin. We call others out on their sin in a loving way. But we have fellowship with one another. If we don't have fellowship with one another, how could we ever have fellowship with God? How could we ever say that we're in the light if we're not fellowshipping with one another? We're not. If we don't gather together and meet and encourage each other and lift each other up and help each other, then we don't have fellowship with each other. And then we are in the darkness. We are in that lie. We must have fellowship with each other. I see many people who post, well, my church is, is out on the water. That's a lie. Church, this is the church, not this building, but the ecclesia, the called out, the called out of Christ. We are the church. And if we don't gather together to have fellowship with each other, we're living in a lie. So if you're out on the water on Sunday morning and you're not gathered together, and you're calling that worship of God? You're living a lie. No better than any of these people that John is writing about. We must fellowship with each other. You know why we lift each other up? We're all going to sin. But I love this part where it says, His Son cleanses us from all sin. That's not just one time. That's a continual cleansing. When we have fellowship with each other, 
when we admit our faults, when we repent for the things that we fail at. And I can only speak for myself. I fail miserably at things. My Christian walk grows every day. But it's because of the fellowship and because of the examples that we have from each other that we lift each other up, that we walk in the light with God. And when we have that fellowship, we are passing the test of the fellowship. So this reminds me of what, John, what Jesus said in John 8, 12. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. When we follow after Jesus with all of our heart, mind, and soul, we are living in that light. We have the light of life. You know, but how can we know we're doing it right? You know, it would be great if God would give us, come down, give us a wink, or send an angel to give some thumbs up and say, hey, man, you got it. You're doing it good. It's not how it works. But thankfully for the word, and in 1 John, we have multiple we can know statements. We can know we're doing it right. And the first one I'd like to read comes from uh, chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. How can we know we're walking in the light? When the darkness represents death and the light represents life. Read with me chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 of 1 John. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So how can we know we're, ta we're passing this, this test of fellowship? Because we love each other. We love the brethren. That we don't always get along, but we got to love each other. We got to love each other and we got to show that love. So, this leads me to my next test. Because if we are truly faithful, then we'll be obedient. And this brings me to the test of obedience. Chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. We find the test of obedience. Now, by this, we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. So, what commandments are we speaking of here? The commandments of Christ. We know from Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40, that Jesus said to them, You shall love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first of great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. We have to love God first and foremost. I, I, I put it this way in my life. I have to put God first. And being a recovering addict, you know, I have to put God in the family of Christ first. That goes first in my life. If I put anything in between that, I'm going to lose it. And next goes my sobriety. I have to put my sobriety right under that. And anything I put in between God and my sobriety, I'm going to lose that. I have to put those things first. You know, I have to put the love of God and my brethren first, and then my sobriety after that. And then after that, it probably comes fishing and arrowheads. But, <laughs> but that's, just, that's just me. But I know if I put anything before God and my brethren in the church, that I'm going to lose it. It's guaranteed. And if I put anything in between any of that and my sobriety, I'm going to lose my sobriety. I have to prioritize the things in my life. And that's what he's saying here. And again, Jesus says this in John 15. I love how the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, they all work together. Some people try to refute that, that John wrote these. No, there's no refuting. If, if you actually read them, you can see where John wrote all this. So, Or not John, but the Spirit of God penned it through John. So let's make that clear. Um, John 15, verses 9 through 14. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So, how are we passing the test of obedience? By loving one another, loving God, by being obedient to his commandments. So, he says here in verse 4, he who says, I know him and does not keep my commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought to himself also walk just as he walked. So how do we know that we're being obedient and passing the test of obedience? Because we keep his commandments. And we walk as he walked. It's very important. A lot of people want to call themselves Christians and then walk as the world. We can't do that. What does it mean to walk as he has walked? This reminds me of Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. When Jesus said, and he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him to deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So, what does it mean to take up your cross and follow after him? It changes every day for me. It grows. Like you say, at the first it was my pickup full of stuff. Was, was what bearing my cross meant. Then it became a trailer full of stuff. Now it's a semi-truck. and I'm hoping it's going to grow into a whole line of semi-trucks. But to bear your cross, it means to have humility, to have self-sacrificing, to do the will of the Father above your own will. You know, Jesus, to bear your cross daily means a whole lot of things. And as you grow as a Christian, it'll mean more and more. It's amazing that, that you know, it starts out as a little, and then as the more you learn, the more it becomes. The more you learn of Jesus and his love for us and what he gave up so that we could have the opportunity to share heaven with him. It's amazing. And we should bear our cross more and more. That should grow more and more every day in our Christian lives. And that includes our walk. You know, a long time ago on the bus when I first became a Christian, somebody says, you know how you know Christians? By their walk. Not by what they're saying, but by what they're doing. And that's so true. If we're just saying it and we're not doing it, then we're not walking it. And we're not being obedient to the will of God. We're not passing the test of obedience. So, how can we know we are truly being obedient? Once again, we go to 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. 1 John 5, 2 and 3. By this we know that we... Love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So how do we know we're passing the test of obedience? By keeping his commandments, bearing our cross daily, and loving one another. All of that is one package of love. Which brings me to the next test which is the test of love. I mean, John speaks a whole lot about love because there's a whole lot to say about love. Chapter 2, verses 19 through 17 is where we'll find this test of love. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness till now. He who loves his brother abides in the light. And there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going 
because the darkness has blinded his eyes. It's amazing that the darkness can blind you. You would think it'd be a bright light that blinds you, but no, the darkness blinds you when you do not love your brother. Not only that, but when you hate your brother, you're blinded by the darkness, by sin. We must love our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, for this there's no stumbling. So, not only will that help you not to stumble, but how much more is it for us to not help to help someone else not stumble? You know, when you're properly loving your brothers and sisters, you will help them and call them out when they are stumbling. You will be there to lift them up. You'll be there to help them, to encourage them, to brace them. It's one of those things we cannot have love and selfishness at the same time. Jesus didn't. If we're to walk as he walked, if we're to pass the test of fellowship and pass the test of obedience, then we must pass the test of love. There is no separation from it. So, also, we can see that another part of the test of love, if you'll skip down to verse 15, is that you do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of, the, of God abides forever. So another part of the test of love is not only that we must love our brother and help them not to stumble as we, as that helps us not to stumble, but we must not love the world or the things of it. We know that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life were the tricks from the devil from the very beginning. And we know those are the same things because of being enticed by our own desires, as we we're told in James, that we're pulled away. We're enticed by our own desires of these things. We must be very careful to not fall under the trap that has plagued every godly person from the beginning of time to now. These are the same things that plague us. But we know God has made a way of an escape. That there's never temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. We know that there's a way of escape. But we must trust in God. And we must stay out of the world. We live in it, but we need to stay out of it. And that's hard. It's difficult. I don't know about y'all, it's difficult for me. I didn't become a Christian until I was 40 years old. So the world was ingrained in me through school, through all these different things. But that's okay, because you know what? The truth is found here, Amen. not in the world. Not in the world. God has the answers for everything. And so when the world tells you that, oh, this or that, no, God has an answer for everything. Everything that we'll ever struggle with. But we must stay out of the world. How do we know that we're doing this correctly? One clue comes from the mouth of Jesus. And that says that the world will hate you. If we're properly not in the love not loving the world as we pro as we should, the world's gonna hate you because you're not of them. You're not a part of them. John 15, verses 18 and 19. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I choose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So one of the tests that shows that we're passing the test of love, it, it, it kind of, almost you'd think it contradicts itself, but the Bible never does. That if you're passing the test of love, the world is going to hate you. The world is going to hate you as it hates Jesus. No, there's no if ands to it. If you're of the world, the world's going to love you. I can only bring up example of a, of a Christian friend of mine who has been struggling, and he used to post all these Bible verses every day, and he stopped, 
and then he posted some picture of him and, and not a good position not not a good place and none of his worldly friends would comment on his bible verses but then as soon as he posted a, a worldly picture oh all of his worldly friends jumped right in oh glad you're back glad to have you back and his christian friends posted what are you doing how, why are you doing this? You know, do you need help? Started reaching out to him. You know, that's the thing. The world wants us to fail. The world wants to see you walk in darkness because they know you as a Christian. And when they see you doing something that isn't very Christianly like, oh, I knew them Christians. I knew they weren't a Christian. I knew that was some fake stuff. Jesus doesn't save nobody. You know, we must make sure that how we present ourselves how we pass that test of fellowship, how we pass that test of obedience, and how we pass that test of love. It's by how we walk. How we see, the world sees us. Because they're going to hate us. Because we are different. And rightfully so. So, but how do we know we're loving in the right way? This goes back to uh, 1 John chapter 3, 16 and 17. This is the we can know statement. For, uh, the test of love by this we know love that he laid down his life for us we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him how does God's love abide in him little children let us not love in word or talk but in deed and truth so if we're loving correctly, we're going to be helping others. We're not just going to be talking about it. We're going to be doing it. We're going to be helping others, and we're going to stay out of the world. And the world will know us because of our love. The world will know that we're different because of that love. So, but in deed and in truth, this leads me to my next test, the test of truth. Chapter 2, verses 20 through 27. The test of truth. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. He, who, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So, how do we know that we pass the test of truth? What is the test of truth? This is the truth. And when we follow it to the letter, we are following the truth. We're having <coughs> fellowship we're having obedience, and we're loving God. And when we test all things to this, we must test all things. If you deny that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God, you are a liar. To deny the humanity of Jesus as the Messiah is rejecting the Father. You can't have one without the other. You can't deny that Jesus was the Son of God and have the Father. We know this from John 5, verse 23, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. It's, you can't separate the two. It's all, all or nothing. So who denies the Father and the Son is a liar. But by denying Jesus as the Son, you deny the only way for humanity to share eternity with its creator. John 14, 6. And Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So all these false teachers coming in and trying to teach something that isn't true, they're only denying themselves a way to the Father. We have to teach and understand that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He was the chosen one, the promised one. He's all these things. 
and he came and lived his flesh. And he bore all of our sins in that flesh on the cross. It's a truth that you cannot get around for Christianity. That he came and lived a sinless life. That is the ultimate truth. We can't say that he had sinned because he was in the flesh. That is the fundamental root of Christianity. That Jesus lived a sinless life so that he could bear our sins. So that he could take our sins upon him. So, if you deny that Jesus came in the flesh, then you have no truth in you. That's what John is saying here. And if you deny Jesus came in the flesh and have flesh and have no truth, then you're denying Jesus. And we know what he says about denying him. We know from Luke 12, 8 through 9. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. We deny that Jesus came in the flesh. He's going to deny us. I don't know about y'all, but that would be a horrible moment. Stand in the judgment seat of God. Depart from me, for I never knew you. But those who believe what they've heard from the beginning about the truth abide in the Father and the Son and have eternal life. What amazing is that? How amazing is the thought of that? I, my mind, anytime I try to think about eternity and life spent with God in heaven, in the light, in the love, in fellowship and obedience, it's amazing. So how can we know that if we are passing the test of truth? This is another we know statement from 1 John 3, verses 18 through 23. My little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whatever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. He, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him. Because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of the Son of Jesus Christ and love one another just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us. And by the Spirit whom He has given us. We know that we're in the truth. And we love each other. Love Him. To keep His commandments. And love the Word of God. And test it. And this leads me to my final and last point of the test of the Spirit. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. And by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming. And is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because He is in you is greater than He who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, we must test everything and hold fast to that which is good. We, by this we will know the spirit of God. How? Because every spirit that confesses Jesus came in the flesh is of God. 
Those who do not claim Jesus came in the, of the flesh are not of God. He is giving these tests to refute Gnosticism. He's giving these tests to them so they can see where the error is and the error in the teaching. We need to use these tests to err today. Nothing's changed. Maybe they call it something else. People are still refuting the word of God. They're still saying that it's not true. We must be very careful to test this against the word of God. What the spirit of God has given us as the truth. We know this is the truth. It's not subjectable. It's not open for interpretation. We know what we have given. We've been given is the truth. And we must hold to it. <laughs> Those of God will speak in the spirit of truth. How can we know we are passing, passing the test of the Spirit? Here's another we can know statement. 1 John 3 and 24. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. We can know. We can know. And that's reassuring. We can know we're doing it right. By testing against the word of God. You know, we don't have to be left in the dark. God's never going to leave us in the dark when it comes to spiritual matters or what he wants in worship or what he wants from us. He's never left us in the dark. But it does take a little muscle and a little shovel to dig it out. You know, we must study to show ourselves approved. It's not something that we can just... I, I wish I could just sleep lay my head on this at night and it would just be there it doesn't work that way God wants us to follow him and that means follow his word and that means study learn on a daily basis if you're not reading your Bible every day I feel I feel bad for you you need to read this great book every single day because that's where the secrets to life are that's where the light is that's where the love is that's where we have fellowship with each other. Even when we're not in church together, you know how we have fellowship with each other? When every one of us is reading our Bible. That's fellowship with each other. So, we can know that we're passing these tests of fellowship, obedience, love, truth, and spirit. When we have the love for God, love for one another, not just any love, but the love God has shown us by sending His Son so that we may have life in the light with Him. I'll read this last passage from 1 John. and kind of just sums this whole book up and it brings that joy that we can find. 1 John 4, verses 7 through 11. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And that's, that sums it up. Are we showing the love to one another that God has shown to us? If not, why not? We need to. We need to be known by our love. So, if you do not, at least it's Bible verses, you know? <laughs> All right. If you do not know the love of God this morning, if you have not put your life to the test, to these tests, if you've not compared, measured your life up to the Word of God, if you have not accepted God as your Father and Savior, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ in your life through the gospel calling, we ask you, please, 
please let it be known and let us study with you. Because this love, this light, love, fellowship, and truth, it's here for every one of us to have. God wants every one of us to be saved. He doesn't want to condemn anyone. But that's on us. That's on every one of us. Or if maybe you just having struggles. We all struggle in life. You know, maybe it's your health. Maybe, maybe it's your family. Maybe it's something that, that you need the prayers of this church for. We know the power of prayer. We know the power of the prayer in the assembly. So if we can help you with anything at all, please come forward as we stand together and sing the invitation song.